Hello, it's Scott Manley here. Over the last year of working towards my private pilot certificate, I spent a lot of time learning the things needed to pass the various tests. There's a fairly broad set of knowledge that pilots are expected to be acquainted with. Aerodynamics, aircraft systems, weather, and of course, a whole buttload of FAA regulations. And there's a whole host of flight instructors on YouTube teaching this stuff. It's fantastic because while you might have learned one thing one way from one instructor, you can listen to the same material from other people or you can do it multiple times. I did it while hiking and it's a big reason why I aced all of the theory exams and I am grateful for this. But I also noticed a few myths and mistakes that were being shared. I mean, and to be clear, these weren't universal, uh, but they weren't unique to one instructor. They were wrong ideas that have somehow taken root within the aviation community. And so I'd like to talk about a few of these. And I feel that, you know, as a sort of public service announcement, I should start with the one that's easy to understand and potentially dangerous for a pilot that believes it. So uh, different grades of aviation fuel are dyed different colors so that you don't confuse them. Because if you fill your aircraft with the wrong fuel, it will probably lead to engine failure and most likely engine failure soon after takeoff rather than when you're on the ground. For piston and engine planes, the most common fuel in the US is 100 low lead and it is a light blue color. And it's really important you don't confuse that with Jet A, which is a light straw color. So what happens when you mix jet fuel and aviation fuel? Well, according to this guide for flight instructors, the color should disappear. The implication is that there's some sort of chemical reaction in the dyes that will be neutralized and that would be a really useful piece of chemistry for pilots. Sadly, it's not true. The colors simply get diluted, but you would be hard pressed to tell if you've got some jet fuel mixed in with your blue aviation fuel because it's just made it slightly less blue. At least the color check is easier for people that are using jet fuel. When they notice a slight blue tinge, they can say, aha, maybe my fuel has the wrong stuff in it. So yeah, don't get your fuels mixed up and don't believe everything you see in a guide for flight instructors. Anyway, that's the only myth in here that is actually dangerous. The only one that might get you into trouble. Most of the others are just interesting corners of physics or engineering. And one example I've seen a few times is uh, talking about humidity. The amount of water vapor in the air is sometimes really important to pilots, particularly because it contributes to weather. There's actually a really basic rule about using the difference between the air temperature and the dew point to estimate the altitude at which clouds form. So warm air contains more moisture than cold air and generally as you ascend the air temperatures drop and once the temperature gets low enough the moisture in the air will start to condense out and form clouds. So the rule is that in, under normal conditions every one degree Celsius in the difference between the temperature and the dew point at the ground corresponds to a 400 feet uh, change in the cloud altitude and this is actually a relatively useful rule, not always true. If you think that's strange and I'm mixing metric and imperial units, by the way, then welcome to the world of aviation weather, where in the US we have weather reports that use measurements in miles, nautical miles, feet, Celsius, and inches of mercury, all in one compact little line that I need to understand. This is all great, right? This is the kind of stuff that you need to know, but why does warm air hold more moisture? Well, a simple explanation offered by a handful of flight instructors is that in warm air, the gas has expanded and there's now more room between the molecules. So you can fit more molecules into that space. See, it's a nice, easy to understand explanation that will satisfy those inquisitive students so that you can move on to teaching more important things like clouds and precipitation and winds. Of course, it's wrong. If it was really about more space, then that would mean that as the air pressure dropped, there would be more room for moisture. And as you went up, why would clouds form? You're making more room for the water vapor, right? That doesn't make any sense. So the truth is, right? The air actually has almost nothing to do with the amount of water vapor in the atmosphere. And there's this sort of 
this this is problematic statement where people say the air is holding water vapor that implies that the air is actually doing something the truth is water vapor is simply a component of the air it's really all about the vapor pressure of water that is the pressure at which liquid water is in equilibrium with its vapor at a molecular level, you can imagine the surface of water and sometimes you have molecules coming in and condensing and you have sometimes molecules escaping into the air. And when you're in equilibrium, the number coming in is the same number going out. And this depends upon the energy of those molecules. The hotter the air is, the higher the energy is, more molecules are going to evaporate until you come back to this equilibrium, until you get this balance. So. Vapor pressure rises with temperature, and as you probably know, at around 100 Celsius, the vapor pressure is one atmosphere, and so that's why water boils at sea level. Now, at more normal temperatures, say 15 Celsius, the vapor pressure of water is 1.7% of a one atmospheric pressure. So there can be at most 1.7% of the atmosphere, uh, of an atmosphere of water vapor in the air. Beyond that, it will start to condense out. If you have a lower amount of water uh, vapor and the temperature then drops, uh, then the water will begin to condense out. And that's called the dew point, right? That'll be the temperature at which the water starts to condense out. So this is actually effectively independent of the air pressure. So the amount of water vapor per volume just depends on the temperature, not upon the amount of air that's there. But if the air pressure, by the way, changes rapidly, say because you've got some shockwave from a jet fighter flying by, then that will actually change the temperature of the air and that can lead to condensation. And of course, that is why we see these cool vapor cones with jet planes and why I need to remind you, these are not sonic booms. So anyway, the myth about uh, the space between molecules persists because it's much easier to explain than all that stuff which requires a lot more physics to understand it. But look, this is easy mode. It's nothing compared to discussing how wings generate lift. And there's a multitude of explanations which are short, easy to understand, and generally work until somebody points out a version or a condition under which it doesn't make sense. For example, the Bernoulli explanation that the FAA wants to teach pilots is that the shape of the wing leads to faster airflow over the top of the wing, leading to the Bernoulli effect causing lower pressures and a pressure difference between the top and the bottom, which translates to lift. So why does the shape of the wing make the air go faster? Well, I'm disappointed to say that I still see equal transit theory raising its ugly non-physical head. That's the idea that the air above and below the wing spends the same amount of time going from the front to the back and the shape of the wing means the air going over the top has to take a longer path and therefore has to go faster. And the idea that molecules parting way at the front of the wing make a pack that they will meet up at the same place in the same time at the back of the wing is ridiculous. The problem is the real reason for the low pressure above the wing is hard to explain easily. The shape of the wing is designed to have the air taking longer pass over the top, even on symmetrical airfoils, by the way. When you have a symmetrical airfoil, you have an angle of attack, and the stagnation point at the front of the wing moves the path one way or another. And sure, that can drive different flow speeds above and below the wing and generate lift. But you can then bring out something like the flat plate wing, which generates lift just fine, even although there is no difference in the path length from one side to the other. It's not a great wing, to be clear, but it's a great way to show that there's more to wing lift than Bernoulli. I like the explanation that uh, curving air flows have lower pressure on the outside, because the air is moving slightly faster, and higher pressure on the inside. And then when you combine this with the Coanda effect, where air tends to air flows tend to follow curved surfaces, that actually gets you a pretty complete explanation, but it is way beyond uh, what I would uh, want to do in this video. But yeah, there are some really good long form lectures by aerodynamics people that do a better job of explaining all of this, and you should totally watch them. There is also another myth by pilots that scientists don't know why wings generate lift. 
And yeah, that's not true. While there are multiple explanations that don't cover every possible condition, you can always come back to Navier-Stokes, which will produce the right number if you can throw enough computer power at it. Scientists know how wings generate lift, but the explanation can't always be boiled down to something simple that can be easily taught and understood in ground school. Uh, the truth is, it's not a level of detail that pilots need to know. What a pilot really needs to understand is that the smooth airflow over the top of the wing is a huge contributor to the lift. So if that airflow stops doing this, say because you exceed the critical angle of attack and stall the wing to generate turbulence, then you're going to lose that lift. That's what pilots need to understand. And, and by the way, since we're here, there is a common statement that the angle that a wing stalls at is the same regardless of the speed, and that's generally true for general aviation pilots, but when you start moving fast enough that compressible flow and the speed of sound start to become important, your wing doesn't behave exactly the same. It's not really fair to call this out as an error, and you should definitely assume that it's true for most things, but it's not physically correct. One common misconception about stalling, by the way, is the idea that uh, all the wing's lift disappears completely once the wing is stalled. And that's not true. When the wing stalls, the wing is actually still generating lift. It's just generating a lot less. The lift to drag ratio drops by a huge amount, so you get a lot more drag. But a plane can, in theory, still generate wing lift with a stalled wing It's not if it's going fast enough, right? But... This is a bad situation to be in. The plane has to be moving faster than normal to generate enough lift. It's experienced a lot more drag. The engine would have to work a lot harder. And when the wings are in this stalled regime, you've got turbulent flows that make for at best a rough ride and at worst a complete loss of control. So it's not an absolute loss of lift, but still not a thing that you want to do. So how about this myth about stalling? The, when a plane is flying as high as possible, how fast is it going? Some sources appear to think that a plane at its maximum altitude is just crawling along at the aircraft's stall speed, teetering on the edge of falling out the sky. Instead, the aircraft at its maximum altitude is actually moving at its best climb speed, the point at which the drag reaches a minimum. The maximum altitude an aircraft can get to is constrained mostly by the engine's ability to generate enough thrust at that altitude. So if it goes higher, then the aircraft gate can no longer maintain airspeed and it will slow down. It's on the back side of the power curve once it slows down, which means the drag increases as it slows down. That With the engine unable to maintain speed, it'll eventually get down to the point of the stalls. And then you're flying on the edge of the stall, but you're unable to maintain airspeed and altitude and you're not at the aircraft's ceiling anymore. So look, uh, point is that you're, to get to your ceiling, you have to beat your best climb speed. And then you can get down to your best stall speed, but you're not hanging at your best stall speed. At that point, you're not at your maximum altitude. Okay, so <laughs> yeah, that's a whole bunch of aerodynamic stuff. Uh, now I would like to look to the future, to my instrument rating. I started actually watching a few instrument ground schools last year because I'd already passed the written test and I wanted to find new stuff to learn. I want to understand what all those other pilots were saying on the radio. So, you know, to fly by instruments, you need to use electronic navigation systems. And one which is common is called VOR, VHF Omnidirectional Ranging. It's a type of beacon which lets planes know where they are relative to the beacon. And specifically, it lets you know what direction you are relative. And so that's what you're setting up. That You want to fly towards this thing on the 180 radial or whatever. So how does it do this? Well, one explanation I've seen given in these ground schools is that it's like a radio lighthouse with a radio beam that sweeps around in a circle. It's sweeping around like 30 times per second. And then there's an omnidirectional synchronization pulse that flash flashes when it hits north. And so what you do is you look for the synchronization pulse and then you count the time that it takes for the beam to come around to you and then you know how many degrees you are away from north. All right, it's really simple to explain, really simple to understand. It's a common explanation. I even saw a YouTube channel, Captain Joe. He is an airline pilot and he's got the same number of subscribers as me. He is clearly a better pilot than myself, but he gave this exact same explanation. And the moment I heard this explanation, as a physicist, I knew that it was dead wrong. Because from my days as an astronomer, 
I knew that the ability to focus a system into a beam is similar to the equation you have for a telescope. So the frequencies you use for VORs are about 100 megahertz. The wavelength is about three meters. And to get one degree of angular resolution, you would need an antenna about 50 times the size, that about 50 times the wavelength. So that would be 150 to 200 meter antennas, right? <laughs> so you would need a 500 foot antenna to get a VOR with one degree of resolution. The antennas that we see are not that big because they are designed by engineers who want something that's efficient rather than something that's easy to explain to people trying to fly planes rather than study RF, you know, physics. So instead of trying to create a narrow beam, the directional component is something that smoothly varies across a full 360 degrees of arc. It still rotates, and if you measure the signal during the rotation, it'll appear to vary like a sine wave. Because it's not a narrow beam, there's no need for this monster antenna. Uh, the signal is varying in space such that observers at different angles will see different phases of this sine wave, and that's how the instrument determines the observer's location. So there's a reference signal that's also broadcasting its own sine wave, but this is omnidirectional, so everyone gets the same phase. So now if you look at the phase difference between the space varying one and the, the reference one, you can get your direction just by looking at the phase difference, or as, pi or as pilots would say, the, the radial, right, with respect to the beacon. So this has another advantage over the radio beam, by the way. It, it collects measurements of the phase all the way through the entire rotation instead of just one moment when the beam passes. So the, inherently you're collecting more data and it is less noisy. There is actually more to this which makes it even more interesting. It's one of those cool bits when you realize how smart engineers are, it, it sort of blows your mind. So I said that there's two signals. How do you differentiate which is the reference and which is the space varying signal? Well, the two signals use different modulation. One uses amplitude modulation and the other uses frequency modulation. Which one is which? Well, it turns out that there are two types of VOR base station using different technologies to generate these signals. But to make them both compatible with the same receiver design, they have opposite direction of the rotation so that in one case, the, the FM is still and the, the AM is rotating and the other one, the FM is rotating, the AM is still and you just have these going you know, opposite direction and they both do give the same answer for the same gear. So in the basic VOR, you have an FM transmitter that's broadcasting the omnidirectional sine wave as your reference and then you have a rotating signal that changes intensity in a, a sine wave. So it sort of looks like a heart-shaped uh, footprint so as it rotates, the amplitude changes and you get amplitude modulation, right? The more interesting one is the one that has a fixed reference signal changing amplitude in a sine wave and it's surrounded by a ring of antenna and the second signal is switched through these antennas sequentially, moving the transmission point in a circle. So the outside observer, this signal appears to be moving back and forwards very, very quickly, 30 times per second. So it gets a Doppler shift, i.e. its frequently, frequency is changing. And this change depends on the observer's position. So you have this frequency modulated signal because it's moving around really fast. So again, you can compare the phase of these two signals and get the bearing. Now the second system is bigger and more complicated, but it does have the advantage but that because the transmitter is moving location, the reflections and echoes also change. So there, there's less error in this part and they tend to produce better results. So why do so many people teach the Lighthouse version, which doesn't match the real thing at all? Well, it's not anything you need to know as a pilot. It doesn't affect how you use these things. I mean, to be honest, these days, almost all the instrument approaches are turning into GPS anyway. It's rare to see VORs. I had to bring them up during the test, you know, during my practical exam, just to show that I knew what they were. But yeah, I think that it's just simpler to teach. And the explanation was originally probably born as a metaphor. And somewhere down the line, people forgot that it was a metaphor and started teaching it as a fact. And that's probably why other myths persist. They're passed from one person to another and the origins and context are lost. They don't have any direct impact on flying the plane, which is what matters. I'm pretty sure that every single one of these flight instructors is a better pilot than myself. But maybe if they've watched this, 
Some of them can become better instructors. I'm Scott Manley. Fly safe.